Let's turn to Acts 15 uh, this morning. And bear with me if I uh, have a coughing spell. Finally got what most of you had. And had it all week. And it feels good to feel good again, I'll say that. But, uh, but there's still some coughs and sniffles that, uh, that, that come from time to time. Acts 15, uh, we, we're going to finish this chapter. We'll start in verse 36. We're going into chapter 16 uh, through verse 5. Things have been going very well for the early church, as you know, if you've been here with us. The gospel's been spreading in obedience to the word of the Lord to take the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, and under the leadership of the two, two great missionaries, uh, Paul and Barnabas, indeed, the gospel was spreading and churches were being established and people were being diverted all over the place, both Jews and Gentiles, and, and even a big church fight uh, didn't uh, stop the progress of the gospel. And, amen! <laughs> but the amen sounds good to keep looking at um, The, uh, lost my train of thought. <laughs> The, um, the Jerusalem Council was precipitated by the uh, church fight in Antioch. It was a doctrinal fight over what was necessary for salvation. People have to be circumcised to be saved. Gentile converts, uh, who today do we have to be baptized to be saved? Do we have to do something besides repent of our sins and have faith in Christ? And the, the council, uh, the leaders of the early church met, uh, Peter, Paul, uh, James, others, and uh, made the decision that we're saved by grace. So I brought you. And uh, the Jerusalem church rejoiced, and the Antioch church rejoiced when they received the news that salvation is indeed by grace. And so, uh, things are only up and up, and God was blessing. But the devil's always at work, he never rests. And so we come today to a most unforeseen development. Father, thank you for your word and uh, bless us. We thank you for the love that will not let us go. We rest our weary souls in you. We give you thanks for the promise that morn will tear us be after all the trials and tribulations of this life. So give us strength and encouragement. We know there is uh, victory in Jesus, that faith will triumph in the end, and so give us encouragement and strength for the facing of this hour. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. All flesh is grass, all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. Grass is grass. The flower fades, the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Well, we're one week from the Super Bowl. Everybody ready? Some years ago, I got to go to the Super Bowl. It was in Atlanta, and I sat on the 50 yard line, and um, so the Titans come within about one football of winning that uh, Super Bowl championship. And this week, I got an email, and I'm, my hopes rose that I might get to go again. 
It was from a friend of a friend until I read the email a little bit closer. Sometimes I read fast and I, I don't catch things, but the email says, it's late notice, but a friend of mine has two tickets for the Super Bowl in Minneapolis on February the 4th. They're box seats. He paid $3,500 per ticket, which includes a ride to and from the stadium, lunch, dinner, a $400 bar tab, and a pass to the winner's locker room after the game. What he didn't realize when he bought them a year ago was that it's on the same day as his wedding. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested, he's looking for someone to take his place. It's at St. Paul's Church at 3 o'clock. <laughs> Her name is Ashley. Five feet four inches tall, good cook, loves to fish and hunt, but clean your truck. She'll be the one in the white dress. <laughs> Some people really love football, don't they? <laughs> Poor Ashley. Paul and Marcus were looking for someone to take each other's place uh, because they had a disagreement uh, here. In the biblical drama of redemption, there's always some conflict. Uh, we are introduced to that conflict in the early pages of the Bible uh, when God forecasts the basic warfare of human history between the woman and her seed and the devil and his seed. And we don't have to go far until we see Cain and Abel in conflict. And that's a story throughout the Bible, good versus evil, God's people versus the devil's people. Isaac against Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, uh, David and Goliath, David and Saul, uh, Elijah and Jezebel, all the way to the end of the Bible, Revelation 12, the woman against the dragon. We get that. We understand that. There's truth against falsehood, light against darkness, the good guys against the bad guys, God's people against the devil's people. What's more concerning to us, more troublesome to us, is when that conflict uh, is within the good guys, and when that conflict is among God's people, uh, or as in this case, it was Paul against Barnabas. These men were friends. These men were believers, strong believers. Uh, these men were uh, missionaries, and they made a great missionary team, but they had a conflict and didn't have a happy ending. So notice, first of all, the source of the conflict. <clears throat> Verses 37 38. Barnabas wanted to take with him John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them in the work. They're ready for the second missionary journey. The first one went so well. Now they want to go again, go back and revisit those churches and re-strengthen, re-establish, re-disciple the, the new converts. And uh, Barnabas wanted to take Mark. And Paul said, no, I don't want to take him. <laughs> Paul is being unfriendly. Well, it seems like it, doesn't it? But you may have forgotten, uh, probably because I never told you. <laughs> and I didn't tell you because it didn't seem like a big deal at the time. But on that first missionary journey, Mark was with Paul and Barnabas, but not for long. He never made it to Antioch, in fact, before he made a U-turn and went, I think, back to Jerusalem. We're not told why, but obviously it did not set well with the Apostle Paul. Does it seem like a big deal to you? Does it seem like the sort of thing that ought to separate close friends to you? Uh, here we are several millennia later, and uh, from where I sit, it seems like they should have been able to work that problem out. But conflicts always seem minor when they involve other people, don't they? When, when you and I are in the middle of those conflicts, it's not minor. <laughs> there are no minor, they're all major conflicts. But looking at it objectively, one wonders why Paul and Barnabas could not have resolved their differences and come to some, some happy resolution. But he was clever, and, uh, and what can be and should be considered minor, sometimes can fester and become a really big deal. My colleague Sandy Wilson used to tell about a mission team in South Africa that uh, had a problem with peanut butter. Seriously. Um, a new 
team member joined them who was very fond of peanut butter. And uh, the other team members have been deprived of peanut butter for a long time and come to regard it as virtuous to live without peanut butter. And a friend from North America sent a new team member a carton of peanut butter. Amen. And <laughs> they're really doing well this morning. <laughs> and uh, the other team members were jealous. And tensions arose, and two of the missionaries left the team, and eventually the mission fell apart. No peanut butter. Maybe there's something else to it. Maybe there's something else to this. We're not told why Mark left, but we just see the end result that Paul didn't like it. When it came time for trip number two, Barnabas wanted to give Mark a second chance, and Paul said no, and to me, and perhaps to you as well, it seems like they should have been able to overcome that. That's, that shouldn't have been an insurmountable problem. In fact, we wonder why the leaders of the Church of Antioch didn't just lock these two great men in a, in a room somewhere and say, we're not going to unlock that door until you men work this problem out because the ministry that you're engaged in is too important for that something like this impede the progress. These men were not novices. They were the leaders in the early church and the first formal missionaries that were commissioned and sent out to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. They were leaders and they were mature believers and they were well respected throughout the region, throughout the Derby. And they said, where's your friend? But it didn't work out. And so having noticed the source of the gospel, they noticed the force. Second. Uh, verse 39, and there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having commended, been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. The word sharp disagreement connotes strong anger and, uh, and indignation, the kind of, kind of red faced anger where strong words are exchanged and the volume is raised and people are uh, almost face to face in a very heated uh, argument. And interestingly, by the way, the Bible doesn't condemn either Paul or Barnabas. It just reports the sad facts to us. And all the sadder because of the context. Because you see, there's just been a real beautiful triumph of unity and love with the Jerusalem Council. That issue had potential to split the church. But they sought help from a regional council. The church in Antioch appealed to the leaders in Jerusalem. They held the council. And a beautiful thing happened. The church was unified. And there was joy throughout. And, by the way, after this divorce between Paul and Barnabas, another wonderful uh, episode of sacrifice and love all for the sake of the unity of the gospel as Timothy was circumcised. Timothy didn't have to be circumcised. He was half Jewish, but he submitted to that, probably Paul's recommendation, so he would not be a stumbling block as these men engaged in ministry. So, so we have this beautiful triumph of unity with the Jerusalem Council. We have another beautiful triumph of unity and love with the circumcision of Timothy. And sandwiched between the two of them is this sad tale of the two great leaders in the early church who divorced, essentially, who couldn't work out their disagreements over John Mark. And I don't have to tell you, it's not the only time in, in church history that this sort of thing has happened. Between high profile people, people that are, maybe it's one of the ways the devil likes to work best, attack the high profile people in leadership that are well respected and, and remind us that they have feet of clay. Augustus Toplady, uh, who wrote the wonderful hymn, The Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, and, uh, and John Wesley, had a fight that would turn your face red. Uh, very strong words were exchanged, and, and Bishop Ryle said of the uh, top lady, <clears throat> never did an advocate of truth appear to so entirely forget the text in meekness instructing those who oppose you. Some of you know that um, J.I. Packer and R.C. Sproul had a falling out. 
uh, some years ago. R.C. Sproul and Chuck Colson had a, had a falling out. People have strong convictions, and sometimes what seems like it should be minor um, is not. Uh, I remember Dr. Eleanor Salto. Do you remember Eleanor Salto, Kristen? The Saltos at Lookout Mountain. And uh, Eleanor was uh, a relative of theirs, like an aunt, I believe. And she was a, pretty much what you call a famous missionary to Muffrock, Jordan, working in the, uh, among the Bedouins in a tuberculosis hospital with a woman named Eileen Coleman who used to come to look out mountain an awful lot. And uh, Salto is a well-respected uh, family in evangelical and informed circles. And, and uh, Eleanor and, and Eileen just did tremendous work among the Bedouins and treating tuberculosis and they wouldn't turn anybody away. And, and uh, it was hard to come by public utilities in those days and healthcare was extremely primitive. And, and Eleanor did such a wonderful job. She was actually honored by the uh, Jordanian royal family. But in 1982, when her church denomination, the RPCES, came into the PCA, she didn't like the way the PCA did things, uh, particularly the Mission to the World Organization. And she just dropped in like a hot potato and jettisoned them and, and, and went somewhere else, much to the chagrin of the, <coughs> of the people at Mission to the World. A great missionary. Mary Slessor was a great missionary. You ever heard that name? And a uh, Scottish woman and serving in West Africa. And uh, where missionaries around her were dying left and right due to the fever, she was rescuing children day and night. But uh, nearly everyone would tell you Mary Slessor was hard to love and hard to like. <laughs> so, have any of you named your children Euodia? <laughs> Anybody? Syntyche. You know who Euodia and Syntyche are? Or were? Read Philippians 4. Paul says, I urge Euodia and Syntyche to stop quarreling. How'd you like to have your name recorded in the Bible? <laughs> For being argumentative. I'm glad I didn't live back then. I'd probably find out the name for all history. Paul saying, I urge Jim to do this or that. Somebody writes a good poem for us. To dwell above with saints we love, indeed that will be glory. To live below with saints we know, that is another story. <laughs> Finally, a word just about the course of the ministry. Verses 39 and 40, I guess I read it earlier. Uh, Barnabas took Mark, Sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers of the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthened the churches. So what was the net result? The missionary force doubled. Actually, more than doubled. Because Timothy joined on. So we have Paul and Silas and Timothy and Barnabas and John Mark. We go from two missionaries to five missionaries. And the result was fantastic. Verse 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He uses our brokenness, our anger, our pride, our frustrations, our failures, not that he approves of them, but he uses them sinlessly to accomplish his higher purposes. Unless you leave today uh, somewhat melancholy, I do want you to know that um, one of the last things the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy as he was in prison in Rome awaiting death, you know what I'm, what I'm about to say? He wrote to Timothy and he said, bring Mark with you. Get Mark and bring him with you. For he is useful to me for ministry. Being interpreted, Paul, near the end of his life, about to die, one of the few people that he wanted to have with him at the time of his death was Mark. <laughs> the very same Mark whom he so deeply mistrusted earlier, so much so that he broke fellowship 
was the man that was probably the best friend in all the world, Barnabas. Now, we don't know if Paul and Barnabas worked it out uh, or not, but at least we know that Paul and Mark became very close friends. Father, we, uh, we just live with moral failure. We're all failures, and, and conflicts uh, riddled our lives and our relationships, and uh, so we do pray that you'd help us, insofar as possible, to live peaceably with, with all people, and to take the log out of our own eye first before we worry about the speck in someone else's. We, we thank you that our failures uh, never thwart your purposes, but are even used by your spirit to further the kingdom. And uh, we give thanks that you are a faithful friend who loves us with a love that will not let us go and who uh, sticks closer than a brother to us. Thank you that the victory is yours, Lord, and is ours through Christ. And so I grant that we would be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving uh, toward each other, just as you have been forgiving of us through Christ our Lord. In his name we pray.